we are going to be 10 billion by 2050. We are going to live on a planet four degrees hotter. We are going to have more mouths and less food. We are going to have less land and more pollution. But we crossed oceans and we defeated diseases. But we went to the moon and we blossomed the desert. Because we are innovators. We are farmers. We are makers. We are dreamers. And we are going to gather and discuss, create and inspire minds and souls. Because we are feeding our future. Hello, my name is Stella Cabadon and I'm 16 years old. Everything progresses, adapts, evolves, and so should the food industry. Status and income translates into awareness and education, which affects the way in which we purchase food. In the food industry, there's a particular sector pressing upon climate change, and that's beef. Beef is a cheap commodity to people like ourselves, but we must start to consider the long-term effects of its unsustainable and continuously growing purchase. As the population grows, the meat industry will also grow. But how and in which form is a question we must ask ourselves. Um, so we can feed our population without having to sacrifice things like fruits and vegetables and legumes and grains. So on behalf of the American School of Milan, um, I leave you with this. We're responsible for our own future and we must take part in it. Thank you. Dear organizers, distinguished guests, let me first thank you for having invited me to speak at the third edition of the Seeds and Chips Summit dedicated to food, agriculture and innovation. The last time I was in Milan was at the Expo in the year 2015. I was speaking at an event called Farmed in the EU in order to promote aquaculture as a sustainable food source. I am delighted that the good work from the Expo is continuing. Food plays such an important role in our life, culture and heritage. Beyond its social role, food production and food industry has a significant economic weight. It carries an undeniable link with health and environment. It should not then come as a surprise that food production and consumption in the European Union are essential in paving the way towards a more sustainable future. Sustainable agriculture is vital if we want to maintain our protected habitats and species and our traditional landscapes. Innovation in agriculture can play an important role in helping the sector become more sustainable both in Europe and worldwide. By innovation, we mean not just the development of new technologies, but also new ways of working with nature and the adoption of ecosystem-based solutions. New partnerships and new ways of interaction between farmers and consumers. Last but not least, new business models and the support for circular and shared economy in rural areas. Information and communication technologies in agriculture should be promoted across member states. Technology should, however, remain at the service of people working in the field. All actors in the food system, but especially farmers, are the managers of natural resources. They should become critical agents of change. They can move us from the current unsustainable system into one that can deliver both food security and environmental protection. 
I trust that this Global Food Innovation Summit will present many examples of these innovative approaches. Many of them are linked to conservation agriculture, to agroecology and to integrated pest management. They are all aimed at increasing the farm's nature-based resilience without impairing production. We need to ensure that these approaches go from cutting edge to mainstream. The fast development of organic farming in the EU over the past decade is one such good example. It is a response to the increasing consumer demand. Successful innovation can bring profit to farmers, quality products to consumers, and solid environmental benefits to all of us. Reconciling the provision of food and renewable raw materials with the protection, enhancement, and restoration of ecosystems is essential. Thankfully, it is also increasingly achievable. These practical approaches will help us implement the Global 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In much the same way, the Paris Agreement aims to reduce emissions and improve the climate resilience of agriculture. Let us move from reducing our environmental footprint to increasing our ecological handprint. Let us give back to nature and to our planet some of the resources it has so generously given to all living beings. On this note, Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I thank you for inviting me and I wish you a most successful event. My name's David Wilkinson. I work for the European Commission. Uh, Commissioner Vella is one of my bosses and I work actually in the science and knowledge service of the Commission, providing the inputs that's needed to make sure that our policies are based on sound scientific fact. And in fact, one of the key roles of the Commission recently has been the supporting of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, um, which was signed by 195 countries. It's a fundamental step forward for humanity, in my opinion. One of the most important aspects of that agreement is that if we can keep climate change under control, then we can grow food more easily in some parts of the world. And, and that includes, of course, many parts like Africa, but also in the southern parts of the EU, Spain, Greece, and so on, where if, we, if we're not careful, there'll be water shortages making food a serious problem. But I'm actually not going to talk to you now about the issue of reducing um, climate change in order to grow more food but rather what can we do to make sure that climate change doesn't go too far? Um, and here you can see, in fact, what are the sources of climate change in the European Union? Well, energy is by far the biggest. Energy and transport together, actually, is 77%. And so that's where most of our efforts are concentrated. But that number is actually coming down relatively well because we're using less energy, and we are generating our energy much more sustainably. And that trend is going on. But the second thing, which is 10%, is agriculture. You might not have thought of this, but agriculture actually is responsible for a significant part of our climate uh, emissions. And it, it, it comes, of course, partly uh, partly because uh, agriculture uses energy, uh, but that actually counts as part of the energy figure. What I'm talking about is the actual greenhouse gases emitted directly from agricultural uh, production. And you can see there are various things. That, uh, some of you will remember your chemistry uh, lessons from school. Methane, which comes mainly from cows, is a strong greenhouse gas, 31 times stronger than CO2. And also nitrous oxide, N2O, this is 130 times stronger than CO2. And it comes off the soil. If we fertilize the soil, 
then some gases come off. Um, don't get confused between nitrous oxide, which is a strong climate change driver, and nitrogen dioxide, which comes out of the back of cars, diesel cars in particular, which causes problems to human health. This N2O, nitrous oxide, is perfectly harmless to human beings, but it causes uh, greenhouse gases, which cause global warming. So, all of this emissions from agriculture actually corresponds then to uh, over 10% of the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions of the EU. And you can see, in fact, it's roughly in two equal parts. Half of it is coming from what they call scientifically enteric fermentation. That's what goes on inside a cow or another ruminant animal. A cow gives out quite a lot of methane. Uh, and this methane comes into the atmosphere. And as long as we continue to eat meat, which, by the way, is increasing worldwide, not decreasing, and drink milk, eat yogurt, and so on, this is uh, a significant fraction, almost half of the total emissions from agriculture. The other half is basically coming, as I explained, from the, directly from the soil, and it comes because we fertilize the soil. So we need to look at those two things if we're going to make progress on climate change. You might say, well, look, you know, this is small compared with the energy, but in fact, we need to do it. If we're going to meet the, the targets set out in the Paris Agreement, we need to look at all sources of greenhouse gases, including these. It's getting a problem. To start with, we were able to reduce relatively easily because we increased productivity uh, in, the, in the agricultural sector. But it, unlike the energy sector, it's not going down. That 10% is remaining stubbornly where it is uh, in terms of the total. And, and so that as a percentage, it's, it's increasing year on year. So in the Commission, we've been looking at all the options for tackling this problem. Um, and how to, what could be the technological uh, uh, approaches that can be used, but also what would be the cost of those technological approaches? Because if, if it becomes too expensive, then it'll be impossible for farmers to implement. And if they don't implement it, production will go down in the EU, but we won't stop eating meat and drinking milk. We'll buy it from somewhere else. So the emissions will still occur they might not be on European soil, but our consumption will still be driving the same emissions of greenhouse gases, and they, it doesn't matter where in the world they take place, global warming will then follow. So we've been looking also at the role of the common agricultural policy, the European Union's common agricultural policy, which is in fact the biggest part of the spending of the EU, to see if we can couple that better to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we've looked at various options for doing that. In fact, we have two different scenarios uh, where, we have, where we target a 15% reduction, either with or without um, subsidies from the EU. And what we discover is that we would really need subsidies to, make for, to allow farmers to make the necessary investments. There are various different approaches. I won't go through them all in detail, but let me pick out two or three which are very important um, because they are really win-win strategies. We can both reduce climate emissions and in, in some cases lower production costs. So win-win, better agriculture, cheaper food, or potentially cheaper food, and lower emissions. One of those is what we call anaerobic digestion and, and manure management. So here, uh, when we collect the manure that comes from dairy production, we already talked about, Commissioner Vela talked about organic farming. We can use that directly to, to do, to, as fertilizer. It's been done for thousands of years, of course. It saves on fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, mineral fertilizer costs. And it can be uh, potentially beneficial, but it would be much better to treat that manure first 
in special plants called anaerobic digesters. These, would actually, these actually release gases, which can be used then as, en as a source of energy. So we would get free energy out of the manure that we're managing. And then the other product that comes out is a really good fertilizer. So it's a no-brainer. It's completely win-win, but it needs investment, and farmers can't necessarily immediately afford to make that investment. Second idea is precision farming. You may have heard about this. Basically, it means using satellite remote sensing from satellites, which are now becoming increasingly common, or drones. You've heard about drones flying over farms. They can detect exactly how well crops are growing, where there are water shortages, and where more fertilizer is needed. And then farmers put, apply water and fertilizer exactly where and when it's needed to maximize crop growth. So, we so the net result of that, we'll be using a lot less water, by the way, which is an important thing, and a lot less fertilizer. And by reducing both of those, we make a very positive impact on climate. So better so-called pre precision farming is, is, is really an important step forward. And then thirdly, managing grassland better. There are two aspects to that. Not using certain types of uh, fields for agriculture, if we can, because they absorb a lot of carbon. Some fields have the capability of absorbing a lot of carbon. And indeed, not thinking about ideas like not plowing fields, but planting crops in, in, in manners which where, where we can save on plowing. It saves a, a, lot of, a lot less emissions from the field, and indeed it saves energy. So those are three things that we in the Commission are trying to encourage, and we're looking at ways now in our new common agricultural policy of making that possible. So let me conclude. First of all, to remind you that apart from the fact that climate change is going to make growing our crops more difficult, we need to look at making sure that growing our crops doesn't make climate change worse. So looking at climate as an issue, uh, sorry, looking at agriculture in an, as, an, as an issue in climate change. We're looking at various uh, techniques and technologies which can be used for that, and then some of these have the potential to be win-win. If we can make the capital investment, we can both lower the cost of production, prepare for a more sustainable environment, economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. So thank you very much indeed. That concludes my presentation. Okay, I'd like everybody to take out their cell phones because I'm going to go really quick. I've been given a limited amount of time and I have four major topics for a very, very complex um, talk about climate change and food systems. Um, so take out your phones because I have some things I want to show you. Earthrise, December 24th, 1968. You've seen this in many, many climate talks, um, but it is the catalog picture when we first saw Earth from a different view. This is another picture, even more famous, the blue marble. And what this does is give us an overview effect or a cosmic perspective, a world without borders, without nations, cultures, countries, one planet. We're all on this vehicle together. There's no walls, there's no countries, there's no... We're all together in this, and that's how we're going to solve this problem, together. And I want you to think about this overview perspective or this cosmic perspective because it's really a system, a complex system perspective that I want to help you understand better today. So, the Earth has an atmosphere around it. Venus has an atmosphere around it. And... Mercury has an atmosphere around it. And there are three different temperatures for each of these atmospheres. 
but we call this kind of the Goldilocks effect. One is too hot, one is too cold, and one is just right. The conditions here are perfect for human life, for agriculture, for development, which are, ne are not found anywhere else right at the moment uh, in our known universe. And so this is another view of the earth, shows our atmosphere and how thin this beautiful layer is, this blue layer that protects us, that creates this Goldilocks atmosphere. We are trapping 400,000 drama, but I wanted to let you know that if you had one of these atomic bombs, similar to the Hiroshima bomb, go off 400,000 times a day, then I think you would be worried about climate change. But we don't have that. Instead, we have an invisible gas that affects us. Things that we do today happen 10 years from now. But then it's too late. The effects and the catastrophe from that are way too late. So we're putting, humans are putting so much greenhouse gas emissions in the air, it's equivalent to 400,000 atomic bombs every single day. Now I want to talk about climate change and food. This is a stat from the U.S. Department of Defense in 2014 that if we do not do something about climate change, we're going to see some pandemic effects. One of them is already been seen, many of them have been seen, with Syrian refugees, so climate refugees. And we break it down into three separate areas, food, water, and disease. Our food supply will be affected, and it's a global system that is very closely tied into a ne nexus or a systems that uh, we need to address. Our food supply, so there's a food surpl surplus and deficit from a study that was done from 1965 until 2012 that shows countries of the world and some deficits and surpluses. This number is not so up to date, it's 2012, but North America uh, had several droughts in the last, and so their surplus is a little bit different than this now. Food supply is affected in many different areas. Nutrition, drought, heat. For every day during the growing season, we have a temperature rise. If it goes above 29 degree, we have effects that go towards our crop yields. By the end of the century, U.S. corn yields could fall by one-third if heat from heat stress alone. And then 1.85 degrees in, uh, Fahrenheit increase could mean decreased yields by 21% worldwide. Pests. How does climate affect pests? Well, Asia has a multi-billion dollar surplus that is high at risk because of pests because of the temperatures rise we get more pests and more food insecurity soybeans well they draw on aphids so as the conditions get warmer in our world we have aphids that affect those crops beetles And then diseases, so all different types of plants and, and trees are affected by temperatures that can cause, in this instance, a rust. So wheat leaf rust, which thrives in high temperatures and can lead to crop losses. And nutrition. So rising um, concentrations of CO2 gases really 
can reduce the levels of nutrients in our crops and in our foods. So um, there's, and I'm just touching on a few and I'm trying to go fast because it's, it's slow, but it's a very complex system that I want you to kind of glean out that in 10 minutes it doesn't give it justice um, of all the different factors. And I'm only touching on a few here that can happen, toxins. So we see here at the conference a lot of vertical farming, controlled environmental agriculture, so that we can maybe take these systems into a closed system that we don't have to worry so much about some climate effects that we really don't know what will happen 100% in 10 years, but we can prepare a little bit better. The next is water issues. 12% domestic use, 19% in horticulture, and 69% in agriculture. As temperatures rise, so does water use. People, crops, energy, industry, and animals all need water. So a big, big thing with agriculture, I, I, I really don't hear a lot of talk about water. There is some, but uh, the Syria climate refugee situation was originally projected by NASA, satellite photos, 2007, that says, hey, there's a, a reoccurring drought coming, be prepared, and the farmers, who are great, and the government and the infrastructure did not prepare properly, and so then, after they kept drilling deeper and deeper, then they ran into many, many problems. Water scarcity affects more than 40% of the world's population, and this is a good slide to take a photo of. There is a, a Bible, so to say. It's called The Limits to Growth, written by Donella Meadows, Dennis Meadows, and a couple others, uh, William Behrens and Jorgen Randers, The Club of Rome, and the Volkswagen Stiftung. This is a publication that first started in 1972, and you might have heard of it. Um, one, of the, one of the things that is often quoted, if we all lived like Americans, we would need five planets worth of resources. So basically it was MIT coming together to do initially a research paper to talk about how our future looks, how much land, how much trees, how much water, how much air a human needs to live in. And that number has changed over the years because of climate change, but it basically says you need around 2.7 hectares of land to sustain Mark Buckley throughout his lifespan. And then they took that natural resources and, and every individual on our planet and kind of did a modeling of it, a very dynamic model with many different facets. And this is a free download for everybody, so I want you to have that, so you have a little bit of an understanding each one of us and our planet has systems. Our planet has five systems. You see the five systems here. Cryosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, and biosphere. All these systems work in harmony. If one of the systems breaks down or gets sick, the others begin to fail. There's no one brain that controls all these systems. They all work in harmony together. As this overview effect, as a collective, as a global planet, as a global earth, we also have systems in our body, 11 systems. These systems all work in harmony. If we get sick, if we have a disease, if we um, break a leg, if we have other ailments, it affects our other systems and of our body. And we get sick and sometimes we recover, but they all work in harmony and there's no one brain or one system in this collective that organizes and rules it all and controls it all. They all work in harmony. I want you to think about systems in this perspective and here is a dynamic model. Systems thinking, the systemic approach for modeling. It's used by the UN, it's used by the European Parliament, it's used by many, many companies, but it's breaking down this complex world, this earth we live in, our bodies, our systems, our food systems, because they're all built on many faceted aspects that need to work in harmony. You just can't say, okay, well, I'll solve the water problem or I'll 
do hydroponics or vertical farming and that'll solve all the problems. No, no, it doesn't work like that. So I want you to know about systems th thinking. There's inputs, outputs, there's feedback loops, um, and it's important. And, and this next slide is showing you places where you can get paid software, free software, where you can learn more about dynamic modeling, about systems thinking, even a mo model used by MIT Sloan for the world climate discussions uh, for the UN. What it does is it's kind of like a role playing or a game where you pretend like you're a politician or someone from the UN and you hold a UN summit to discuss climate on how China or the US or whatever your country is so you can understand how complex these processes are. Because it's important that we understand how they all fit together. And that brings me to the sustainable de development goals. This is how we've seen them normally. Uh, I hope you've seen them anyway. They're very important. They, f they actually followed about the same time as the Paris Agreement, uh, where the world came together in 2015 and it agreed on, agreed on 1.5 degrees uh, to keep us under that warming temperature. Um, but there are 17 goals that kind of are a system to address all the problems we face that need to work together. They can't always just be seen individually so that they can then be um, put into a system or model for success. Here's a, an article from The Guardian. Well, more than half of the world's businesses do not really understand or know or do anything about the US, UN sustainable goals, development goals, and that's very sad because Here's another picture that most of you have not seen. It's a pie chart, and I'll explain why the because is that, that companies probably don't understand or know the benefit of following the sustainable development goals. But this is a cake or a pie or a food pyramid of the sustainable development goals. It was released by Johan Rockström and the Eat Form, and it's more how I see the sustainable development goals with the most important aspect being at the bottom. The bottom of these goals is agriculture, food, beverage, our natural resources, water, fresh water, biodiversity. And then it moves on up the chain in order of importance or up the pie or cake in order of importance. But the base, the hierarchy of needs, the most important thing for us as humans and our planet is this bottom half. If we don't have those basic necessities, that system, that pie, doesn't grow, it doesn't, it, it collapses. And so um, that's why agriculture, food, and beverage is the absolute most important key for us to solve and figure out. It touches every human on earth. Not every human on earth has a car. Not every human on earth uh, uh, uses fossil fuels to some respect. Uh, but every person eats at, has health, goes to the doctor, or needs to survive. That's a basic human need. And here's where the aspect comes in why businesses don't understand that. They're looking for money, handout, I've got an idea, I've got a vertical farm, I've got a water solution, and I need some money to do this job, or I need to, this money to start my company. What they don't know is not only at the Paris Agreement, did we come together as countries and agree to that uh, uh, on 1.5 degrees of warning? We also agreed upon the sustainable development goals, and in the sustainable development goals, there's a number, a dollar figure that we've come up with that we need to invest in 15 years, back in 2015, by 2030, in order to make sure we reach those goals. If we do not invest this money, if we do not have new projects, if we do not change to sustainable uh, um, projects or, or businesses, we will not be under 1.5 degrees. We will go way past, and, and nobody really knows what those catastrophic events will be. So I want to break this down just shortly. 
90 trillion US dollars in 15 years by 2030, started in 2015. In 2015, I, uh, you could probably tell me better, but I don't think we made over 368 billion dollars of sustainable investments. It was at the end of the year. The, the agreement wasn't until later in the year, so that's okay. 2016, I believe the number was higher. It was around 860 something billion. Still, it was under a trillion. We will need to invest private, green bonds, uh, venture capital, any kind of investment, countries, states, locally, six trillion US dollars a year. I hope we're on track this year for 2017, but I have a funny feeling we are not. This money needs to be invested, and I, I, that's why sustainable businesses, that's why uh, it's really a good thing. And, and this is actually one of my favorite slides. It was an old, um, older report done in 2012. It was a five-year study that was done in report by True Cost and also KPMG. And it is the total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA. So, my mentor, Al Gore, uh, Obama yesterday, uh, Sam Cass, many people say the fossil fuel in, uh, um, industry, uh, energy industry is our biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. I don't really want to disagree with them, but I have to because there's many other facets of this system that you need to break down and understand that no, in fact, it is the agriculture, food, and beverage industry that has the largest impact on climate change. If you look at the energy sector, yes, the profits and, and, and the EBITDA on that side is huge, but the environmental impact is 23%. Now you look at food and beverage produce, production, which really is not the full aspect of agriculture. It's also not the full aspect of beverages. They're, the numbers aren't 100% what I believe they should be, and it's a little bit older study, but it's 224% of EBITDA. That's clean and process, that's water waste, that's food waste, that's many other factors that are di uh, uh, going into this. That's um, natural capital that's not being paid for in advance. That's this... Um, um, natural resource curse that we sometimes talk about where countries have a lot of oil or a lot of things that really that doesn't come back in the long term for our, our, our countries, our, our world and, and different things and so it's an imbalance that cannot go on in a finite planet. We're eating our planet, we're eating the finite resources and so we need a global food reform. I believe the agriculture food and beverage industry globally is the leading major cause of climate change to hu uh, and human suffering and it is really time to take this industry out of the industrial age and I, I tease sometime I kind of say the dark ages um, into a really new age of, of, of sustainability or a sustainable scene something that is much more sustainable and it's not just our world, it's not our bodies, it's a, the system, the planet that we live on. We really need to make sure that we're all sustainable. Our businesses are sustainable. It's not just a word we use, but it's sustainable because in a finite planet, that business still exists 10, 20, 30 years from now, and humanity's better because of it. This is from the EAT form. Um, I'm very... Uh, proud of what they're doing to reform the food industry and, and the, the movements they're doing. So I wanted to show you this slide. Is why do we need to act and transform our food system? And it talks about, you know, obesity, nutrition, and things. It's important to take a picture of this and, and um, go to the EAT form. Make yourself aware. It's, to, it, it's the, even better than seeds and chips. I love seeds and chips, but it's the pinnacle of food, beverage, agriculture. It's like the World Economic Forum for food. It's like the Climate Conference for food. Um, and it's really important that you make yourself smart on these things that you do every day. Food, you eat every day, you drink every day. These are the big 10. 
we love them, we hate them. They have great sweet products, some I'm addicted to. Um, but this is, for the long time, has really been the controllers of our world food. So they control the majority of the brands that we eat. Ten big companies. And um, I don't know. I never told them that I wanted any of these products. When I was a child, uh, you know, some chocolates and maybe some colored cereals. Um, but we need to have more systems thinking or more interaction with our food and how we're involved, what the, the good food producers and the bad are producing for us, that we let them know what we want them to produce. These are some new companies. They're not among the Big Ten. Some, some have been purchased since, but they're new innovators, new brands that are coming up with coconut water and new types of ice cream and new types of uh, innovative methods and, and food products. Um, Memphis Meats, Impossible Foods, so the uh, vegetable uh, uh, um, replacement for meats, things like that, some plant-based milks. And now I'm going to wrap up and basically tell you what my solution was for my company. I own a company that's called Anya stands for Adaptive Nutrition Joint Achievements, and we uh, have a facility. It's called the Alohas Eco Center, and it's a complete systemic approach based on clean tech and renewable energy. And we took a systems approach, and we addressed these six major things and many more in, in a dynamic system, and a system that is really based off of the water f power and food nexus. So we know that there's many facets in food production and the three major players are water, energy, and food. And so we don't take natural fresh groundwater or seawater. We use ambient water harvesting, rainwater harvesting. We have special clean and process techniques for our production facility. We do gray water recycling and black water recycling, treatment and recycling for fertilizer and some different things that were also mentioned. Then we do, we produce our own energy. So if you ask most of the vertical farms or the uh, in innovations here today, they say water, power, and space, or rent, or uh, available space to do their business are the th main three drivers of how they, what their costs are, what's cr giving them heartaches. And we've taken that out of the equation. We produce solar, wind, and hydrogen power. We use germal, uh, ge geothermal heat energy. We have battery storage and Tesla power packs. Um, gravity energy flow, ground energy storage, and electrical logistics for trucking and for cars and for other options inside our facility. And then we do different types of uh, vertical farming, hydroponics, aeroponics. We use, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, a circular economy. One planet living circular economy, cradle to cradle principle. It's based and inspired off of the books and the circular economy. Ellen MacArthur Foundation, William McDonough, and Michael Braungart, who wrote the books Upcycling and Cradle to Cradle. And basically there's a biological or an organic cycle and there's a technical cycle. And we try to keep closed loops. So when we create something, we want to make sure it stays in that loop and we're not creating waste, but that we're using the um, water uh, power food next. Large production facility CO2 neutral, energy balance equal to net zero, Growing vegetables exclusively with rainwater. The green production facility of Anya GmbH turns current food and beverage production facilities on their head. Our complete concept of an urban green production facility sets new standards worldwide. By combining technology, innovation, renewable energy, and the recycling of resources to a holistic system, it is a truly green system. The sun, wind, and rain are our primary energy sources, along with Tesla power packs as backup. Our energy balance is net zero 365 days a year. Our process uses a complete water cycle management system that resolves the unsustainable water imbalance currently used in the food and beverage industry.
We recycle and use our rainwater to 100%, and we access and protect our own natural groundwater because we filter the water with reverse osmosis equipment, and we recycle 100% of our gray water. By using only organic filtered rainwater and automated vertical farming, we have optimal space and power utilization that allows us to grow a portion of our raw materials in-house. Our adaptive nutrition concept is adjustable to the personal circumstances of each individual. All our healthy products are 100% vegan, gluten and lactose free, GMO free, contain no added sugar, have no added preservatives or fragrances or flavor enhancers, so they are completely organic and are very delicious. Our environmentally friendly packaging is completely recyclable. Current food and beverage production facilities have stood long enough on their heads. We place them back on their feet. This is the Lohas Eco Center. It's uh, based in no just north of Hamburg, Germany, in the region Haida. It's a 50 hectare property, 40 hectare facility, has 190,000 solar panels on it, uh, generates 63 megawatts of renewable energy a day. Um, right now we're using a system with DHL Go Green Plus, which is a carbon swapping logistic program, but we have a partner with Tesla. And in September, the Tesla truck will come out, electric truck, and we're hoping to integrate those uh, very rapidly into Europe so that our logistic carbon footprint is um, electric. The top corner, we're right on a freeway exit. The top corner there is a Tesla supercharging station and a hydrogen power charging station for e-cars, e-cars only. And then we have a, a, an electric truck logistic rest stop and center for the trucks to charge. And we have an eight level or eight floor vertical farm. So on each floor there's 12 shelving racks. It's a total of 38 uh, million square meters. A uh, total of vertical farm growing space is 3,700 uh, 3, hectares of vertical farm, indoor controlled envir ac environmental agriculture growing space. We have two wind turbines, 2.5 uh, megawatts per turbine, so five megawatts of, uh, of wind turbine uh, renewable energy, and we also have five megawatts of hydrogen uh, energy. There's a facility, the Haida, I don't, if you're not familiar with, is northern Germany and it's really the renewable transition area. There's the Entree 100 and EE 100. And this is it, and I'm done. Thank you very much. Fourteen million square kilometers. Do you know how much that is? No? Then I want to make an experiment, do an experiment with you, one I saw from Professor Mitt Lerner at the University of California in Davis. And take a sheet of paper, you all should have one. Okay. So now let's fold this sheet of paper in two. Oh, this is our planet. Well, it's flat, but still imagine it's our planet. And now I want you to take this sheet of paper again and fold it again in two. Okay. This is the amount of emerged lands that we have without any water in it. Uh, so the seas, oceans, rivers, lakes. Now I want you to take this sheet of paper again and fold it in three. Okay. This is the amount of agricultural land that we have, including marginal lands, pastures, and the agricultural land where we grow our food. Now I want you to take this sheet of paper again and fold it again in three. And this, this is the, the arable land that we have, the, the land that is actually suitable to grow our food upon. And this 
is 14, 000, 14 million square kilometers. And what we do with this impacts everything that's around this. Waters, seas, oceans, all the other land. So now, what do we do with this? And how can we, how can we feed and we grow enough food on this for a population that is growing? Some estimates say that by before 2050, it will be 9 to 10 billion people. And the most growth is occurring in developing countries, Asia or Africa, where already today, 800 million people are suffering from hunger and starvation. So, how can we feed everybody? How can we bring enough food? Or how can we teach those populations to grow enough food for their own sustainability, for their own sustenance? What is the solution? Um, the idea of transferring and teaching them to do what we are doing now can be an idea, but we all know that intensive agriculture as we know it today is creating a lot of problems. Dr. Wilkinson already uh, highlighted how much uh, agriculture pollutes the air and contributes to greenhouse gas emissions and climate changes. These are just some images. Take the first one on top. This is an, an ESA picture of the Po Valley, right where we are now. And this is not air pollution, this is ammonia. Ammonia is mainly emitted from agriculture. And despite ammonia not being one of the greenhouse gas gases that we know and uh, everybody talks about, is strictly connected to particulate matter formation. This is a problem that we, have, we are facing now, because particulate matter is what creates problem of asthma, respiratory, breathing problems to our children, my children. The second is water pollution, eutrophication, not having enough fresh water. And this is again caused mainly by agriculture. Leakage of nitrogen from manure, from excess of fertilizers. What does that mean? Is that again, intensive agriculture is creating soil degradation. Again, this piece of land is reducing, is shrinking, while the population is increasing. What does that mean? Is that people around the world, especially in developing countries, are trying to find new lands and deforestation. Again, we are taking out one of the lungs of our planet. So, are there alternatives? Are there a solution? This is a summit of innovation, so we know that there are, I don't know, backyard farming, city farming, city gardening, vegetarianism, or other sources of protein. These are a very good solution. They can be a very good solution for cities, maybe, but if we think of developing countries, they are already, most of them are farmers already. Most of them already eat mainly vegetables because they can't afford meat, but they would like to afford meat. President Obama yesterday said that a lot of developing countries, as soon as they reach middle class incomes, would want to eat meat. Why should they? shouldn't they? And other sources of protein, again, if we think of Asia, insects or other different kind of protein sources are a normal part of the diet. So these are not actual solutions for them. Our idea uh, is that a different model of intensive agriculture is possible. And what is what we call sustainable intensive agriculture. How can we achieve that? This is a, by acting and interacting with a part, a small ally that has been kind of neglected by traditional agriculture so far, which is the microbiome. Microbiome that we can find in the soil and on the plants microbiome that we can find in the animals, in the guts animals, it's inside us as well. Microbiome that can, we can use and we can have as, as an ally to exploit and to valorize manure and animal effluents. Actually, it's what our company has been doing for the past 15 years. Create product, products and solutions that could interact with the local microbiome of the different realities. This allows us and allows our farmers to reduce the inputs with less chemical fertilizers and agrochemicals, reduce the amount of feed to grow the animals that people want to eat, and at the same time, increasing the yield. So this overall translates into an increased efficiency throughout the entire food chain. So from the soil to your plate. And this, 
also en enables our farmers to increase their profits and lower their costs. Because as President Obama yesterday said, there's no point in having a technology that is not affordable or is not economically viable for farmers or for growers, especially in those poor countries. And on top of that, the possibility to reduce chemicals, chemical fertilizers, the amount of feed of food require, required enables us to reduce the, our impact on the environment. I want now to show you some of the results that we are having. This is a time lapse of barley, two seeds of barley placed on two jars with actual ag agricultural soil, the standard cultivation method and with the SOP method. You see how faster the plants are growing, how faster and stronger they are developing, already in a few days' time. And look at the root system. This is the, the mouth of the, of the plants. If they have larger mouths, longer and stronger ones, they could resist better to heat stress, for example, as like Mr. Buckley was suggesting, and uh, having and exploiting better whatever nutrients that you feed them. And also the amount of soil microbiome that grows around them helps them throughout the entire cycle of the plant. This is another example, a tomato plant, and just to, to make a good plate of pasta. And this is a young vine plant. Again, a new time lapse. On 60 days, you could see how faster the new blooms are blossoming, the new leaves are sprouting. And again, by exploiting the ability of the soil microbiome to convert whatever nutrients the plant needs into a form that is stable, that is there, that is not going to leach into fresh water, ground waters, creating all the problems that we've seen before. Of course, we need to feed the plant, but we can feed them less. The results are incredible. And the thing is, once the plant feels that the environment around it is healthy, is stronger, is full of nutrients, then it simply grows better. But what's the point of producing food if then it goes to waste because you can't preserve it? This is another example of simple bread inoculated with a very large amount of mold. So it's nothing comparable to what you can have in the normal production facilities. But this is an example of how conditioning microbes that are from the environment, in the environment, can help us to save food. Let's move now to real cases, real farmers that are actually using our products. So again, standard cultivation methods, again, our kind of treatment. And this is the example of root system that could be achieved not just on um, annual crops, like corn or barley, like we saw, but also on perennial crops, orchard, improving the amount of yield, improving the quality of the final produce, and all of this could be obtained, and is obtained actually, from our farmers with a reduction of chemical fertilization. This is important. This is, besides the cost for being a cost for the farmer, is something that can create, and is creating, as Mr. Wilkinson said before, problems to the environment, pollution. 33% in the first year compared to the standard cultivation. 55% in the second year and up to 60% in the third year compared to standard cultivation to obtain actually even a better product production. So this does not come at the expense of production and not, this does, not, does not come at the expense of the farmer's profitability. These are other examples. Mr. Buckley correctly said that milk and beef and meat are one of the main polluting sectors for our, for our world. So what if we can increase the productivity of meat and milk with the same resources we have, both in milk and in meat? And this is done in the Po Valley again. This is one of the most productive areas in the world for milk. We're not talking about India, where the, feed product, the milk production per cow is actually 5 liters, not 35. And this is an example of how, on a real farm, feed efficiency is measured. These cows are simply eating less for producing the same amount of milk that this farmer is supposed to be, giving again an, a saving in cost for the farmer and a saving of cost for the environment. At the same time as well, conditioning the microbiome from the manure, we could also reduce the emission gases that come from that. And it's all a microbial activity. If we can condition the microbial activity, 
like this, we could reduce the emissions. Ammonia, like we saw in the Po Valley, ammonia that comes from the, from the, 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 the manure. Actually, with Professor Mitlone, we are studying also what the impact of our product and certifying that, what can impact of our product have on the greenhouse gases. Also, at the end of the presentation, I would invite you, everybody, to sniff some of the cow manure that we placed just close the exit. And an indirect benefit of our product is also that since we are working only with the microbiome, we don't need actually great amount of products to feed the plants. We just need to condition the microbes, and that they will do the work. So the idea is, transportation-wise, if we consider carrying around fertilizers around the world and around the countries just to feed the plants, one single truckload of our product is able to replace, with the same decrease that we saw before, more than 500 truckloads of urea. And this is another positive and important impact that we can have on the environment. So we do have an idea of what to do with this piece of land, and I would invite you all to our booth to discuss about that. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. I will try to tell you a little bit what we are trying to do specifically in uh, the coffee sector. So in 2015, we had the opportunity of organizing the largest and greatest celebration of coffee in Milan at the Expo. We spoke about uh, the past, present, and future of coffee. We had 13 million visitors at the coffee cluster, and we did organize a wonderful uh, global coffee forum together with 40 producing countries. During the Global Coffee Forum, besides talking about climate change, we had as a special guest Jeffrey Sachs, who presented his research about uh, coffee and climate. And you will see the outcome, because the outcome is, uh, is quite uh, uh, scary, potentially scary. But most importantly, what we did at the end of this conference has been uh, uh, acknowledging the existence of this uh, virtuous cycle linking uh, the smile of those who drink a cup of coffee together with the chance that we give to those who produce it. Coffee is grown all in the south of the world, over 50 countries, 25 million people. Yet these 25 million people get only 10% of the uh, aggregated value of the coffee market, which is 200 billion. So they get 20 billion. But of course, if you consider the uh, classic 80-20 rule, you will discover that 80% of these 25 million people, 20 million, live with less than $2 per day. So the more we consume coffee, the higher the quality and the premium price consumers to, are ready to pay, the more we give a chance to those people to pull out from poverty. And this is already happening now, since 20 years. Coffee was able to develop three great virtues, pleasure, health, and sustainability. Coffee used to be a commodity. Now it's an experiential product. People love to taste, to prepare, to discover. Preparation did improve thanks to many technologies. Better places for consumption. Health. People used to think that coffee was bad for health. Now it's clear that coffee makes you live better and longer. Even the World Health Organization did decide to reclassify coffee in a better way last year. And sustainability is improving. 20, 30 years ago, they were deforesting to produce coffee. Not now. 20, 30 years ago, they were polluting with coffee agriculture. Not any longer, at least if you apply the best agronomical practices. And finally, 20, 30 years ago, it was about slavery. Not any longer. So for experts traveling around producing countries, they will discover that things are improving, also from the sustainability point of view. 
So our commitment, together with the 40 countries participating to this Global Coffee Forum and all the intergovernmental organization has been, we must nurture this virtue cycle. And uh, keep doing the same things that improved the situation in the last 20 years by increasing the product value with better and more differentiation, quality, and sustainability. So, now the coffee outlook is that growth, 2% average growth, more than 2% now, used to be one, less than one, 2.7 last year, two years ago, great. 1.5 billion, billion coffee consumer in the world, used to be 600 million, you know, 50% OECD countries consuming coffee used to be 80%, but still big opportunity for growth because we still have at least five other billion people who can drink coffee in the future. Well, yet we are not producing enough. Already we are depleting our stocks. Already there are issues which uh, let's say, cut off the efforts of increasing coffee production, as you can see from these numbers. So, what's the problem? Climate change. Climate change is not only impacting quality, the very first impact is quality, but it's impacting productivity. From this Jeffrey Sachs study, we discovered that up to 50% of the currently suitable land might not be suitable any longer by 2050. So, which is a significant challenge to produce twice as much that we will need in 2050 with half of the suitable land. Is it possible? Is it feasible? It could be possible. It could be feasible. But it, it will take time because, you know, the average lifetime of one coffee plantation is 30 years and it takes minimum four years to enter full productivity. So that means that if we want to have the solution from now to 2050, we really need to start running very, very fast now. Shouldn't we be able to find a solution that would be a price shock. Like oil had a price shock, you know. The oil barrel went uh, from $30 in 2005 and six, uh, four and five, sorry, to one, over $100 per barrel. And this caused a dramatic economic shock. It might be the same. Already, coffee had a little shock in 2012 with the longest period, 18 months, of prices twice as high as normal average. But in addition to this price shock, which might impact also consumers, you know, there will be a significant uh, social problem because most of this Rural communities producing coffee will not be able to cop. And so they will not be able to produce enough coffee for their $2 per day. So climate change could jeopardize this wonderful and virtuous effort which made the coffee agriculture much more sustainable in the last two decades. And this is really something we don't want. So investments, we heard that we need to spend 90 trillions by 2030, and coffee is part of this investment. Investment in these growing countries are made difficult. Are made difficult by first one structural factor of the coffee market, which is volatility. You have prices that can even multiply by nearly 10 or 8 over maybe four or five years. 
I give you figures. In 2002, in all-time minimum prices, the coffee price was around 41 cents per pound. And five years later, it was uh, over $3 per pound. So it can happen. But guess if you are a grower, a tiny grower in the developing countries with no capital, sometimes with difficult legislative, legislative uh, systems that even prevents you to have a clear ownership of your land, how can you make investments if the market is so unpredictable and then you don't know which will be your cash flow? So underdevelopment and volatility of the market makes it very difficult for these countries, developing countries, to make the necessary investment for our nice cup of java. On top of this, there is a consolidation of the coffee market with large in investors building huge market share in the coffee market. And of course, they will uh, you know, squeeze margins. This has also to be taken in account. Because if you have incre incremental returns, you can better invest rather than if you have decremental, decreasing returns. So, what do we need in terms of adaptation? What do we need to adapt the coffee agriculture to climate change? Well, three sequential efforts. One is to change the agronomical practices. They are still quite, I would say, traditional. We would need to go back to agroforestry. We would need to have irrigation. We would need to shadow the coffee plantation. We would need to have a better usage of uh, uh, phytosanitary you know, products. We would need to mechanize agriculture using robotics in agriculture and so on, all requiring investments. We would need to change the way coffee is collected and processed after the crop. If this changing the agronomical practice is not necessary, then we would need to change the cultivars. Because as we have seen for other products, of course there are the same diseases. Coffee leaf rust impacts coffee as well. Drought impacts coffee as well. Too high temperature impacts coffee as well, with a dramatic drop in, profit, in uh, productivity and so on. So we might find through genomics, not necessarily GMO, but we might have new cultivars which are resistant to the effects of climate change. And one of the reasons why I'm doing personally this kind of study for the whole coffee community, because we had the privilege with our colleague Lavazza and other colleagues to uh, finalize the mapping of the Arabica coffee genome. So now that you have the genome, we can work and quickly develop new cultivars. This is another resource. And last but not least, is also with new cultivars is not enough. We will need to migrate coffee plantations to higher altitudes or higher latitudes. You know, guess, I was a intrigued by this idea that there is one coffee plantation in California. I read something in the press three years ago, and I asked my team, I want to go and see one of the, uh, what, what, this uh, coffee plantation. Guess how many they are now? 16 already in California. Next will be Florida, then it will be Sicily, it will be Argentina, it will be everywhere. Of course, away from the tropical belt where coffee is currently grown. So these are kind of dramatic changes which are already happening. So the situation is that these changes are already ongoing. And in order to adapt quickly enough, there are many projects. Some are really good, some are less good, some are tiny. We are not sure how many they are. We are not sure how impactful they will be. We are not sure if they are underfunded. Uh, there is no coordination. So if we want to accelerate, because we need significant human knowledge and financial resources, we need to accelerate this uh, innovation process. 
So several organizations are already on board, but they are competing uh, among each other, and so they are kind of uh, jeopardizing these efforts. And this puts my big question mark, and there will be never an answer to this trade-off. Could we improve? Could we accelerate this process with better governance? Or shall we leave this uh, implicit coordination to the so-called invisible hand? You know, we will never know, but we can try to do something. So this is also because in the coffee industry, which is quite developed from this point of view, we already had some great successes in the past by coordination, by cooperating among uh, all you know, stakeholders in the value chain. What I said about health has been a significant result only made possible thanks to a lot of collaboration among uh, roasters, traders, NGOs, associations, and so on. So if we succeeded already once in one big success like health, why shouldn't we be able to succeed also with climate change? This is why we are thinking about this. The coffee gap, coffee global adaptation plan, which is the idea of one uh, public private partnership, multi stakeholder involving consumer countries, producing countries, industry, trading, NGOs, government, intergovernmental uh, organizations for three. Only three core activities, a very lean organization, a kind of an international agency in order to raise money, to be allocated to these best projects. And there is a ton of public money available. You just need to organize yourself for the sake of having the getting it. Knowledge transfer, most of the knowledge and the know-how, the technology in order to improve agronomical practices and change cultivars sits in the consuming countries. So how can you facilitate the knowledge transfer to developing countries? This once again requires a global governance framework. And last but not least, coordination in order to avoid duplicating efforts in order to avoid reinventing the wheel each time you start a new project. And this will also require the generosity of some of these producing countries which are already ahead in the adaptation curve to teach other countries how to do it. So this is what we are working. And uh, we are working now on that as a, you know, as a follow-up of the expo of this uh, Milan coffee legacy and uh, there is uh, a team of uh, the most important coffee roasters in the world, a team of the, the most important NGOs, a team of the most important coffee producing countries and intergovernmental organizations, uh, teaming up with a task force in order to come up in a few months with a project proposal. The good news is that we have UBS on board, UBS is the most important bank in the world for philanthropy. And philanthropy, you know, is a one trillion market in the world. But UBS tries to address uh, philanthropy through the idea of sustainable investments or impact investment, which is synonymous. It means that it's still an investment which have a payback, even if it is lower than a speculative investment, and they are allocating Five billion for that. So the resources are there if there is the political will, you know, and the capacity to coordinate and cooperate. I really uh, hopeful that we will be able to adapt uh, in, due on time. Thank you very much. So, hello, I will speak in Italian because this concept I'm, I'm going to say are hard for me, are uh, the scientific words 
and I'm much more, I'm feeling better if I can speak in my language. Eh, buongiorno a tutti, parlerò in italiano, sono, mi dispiace quasi di essere la sola, ma sono qui per rappresentare gli agricoltori che in questo summit sono stati nominati, sono i protagonisti, si può dire, di questa... Di, questa, di questo tipo di, di, di consessi dove si discute di come eh, appunto eh, produrre di più sfruttando al meglio le risorse. Ora, eh, quello che io posso fare, eh, non, saranno, non sarà una, uno speech scientifico, quello che io posso fare è una fotografia che viene dalla terra, che viene dal nostro lavoro, una fotografia di come operativamente il climate change impatta sulla produzione. Partiamo dall'inizio però. Allora, l'era che stiamo vivendo eh, è quasi universalmente riconosciuta essere antropocene. Antropocene è eh, l'era di, di vita della Terra dove eh, l'uomo ha influenza, dove l'uomo sta impattando sulla, sulla vita del nostro pianeta. Perché dico questo? Come vedete, questo è un grafico famosissimo, eh, la, la, mostra le variazioni di temperatura del pianeta e non è la prima volta che il pianeta cambia come clima, non è la prima volta che si evolve, però questa è la prima volta che il cambiamento è accelerato, come vedete in coda, dalla presenza dell'uomo sulla Terra. Ci sono diversi problemi che noi vediamo in campagna rispetto al riscaldamento terrestre. Non sempre il riscaldamento terrestre poi si traduce in più caldo, può essere che si traduca in più freddo. Noi abbiamo per esempio il primo problema che vediamo è la disponibilità dell'acqua. Perché? Perché dobbiamo gestire queste grandi energie, delle, delle grandi quantità di energia nell'atmosfera che scatenano fenomeni estremi. Quindi, Siccità eccezionali, questo è il fiume Adige nei giorni, in questi giorni, quando sono, sono venuta via da casa pioveva, eh, il fiume Adige dà acqua a tutto il Basso Veneto, a tutta la pianura del Basso Veneto, dove io vivo, e dà acqua soprattutto a 300.000 persone. Quindi non, siamo in una situazione dove man sono mancate le piogge autunnali del 2016, sono mancate le piogge invernali del 2017, stanno mancando le piogge primaverili del 2017. Questa è la situazione, sono emersi ponti di guerra, reperti, sta diventando una meta turistica perché l'Adici in questi giorni si attraversa a piedi. Abbiamo invece il contrario. Perché? Perché la quantità di acqua che precipita annualmente non è meno di prima, ma si concentra in poche ore, cadono, in poche ore cadono sei mesi della quantità di acqua che avevamo precedentemente. Quindi poi abbiamo il problema di, di, delle alluvioni fondamentalmente, perché non siamo in grado con il nostro tessuto di canali di trattenerla. Eh, questa è l'alluvione del Veneto del 2010, eh, 5.000 ettari eh, con due metri d'acqua, nel 2014 ne abbiamo avuto un'altra, ne avremo sicuramente altre ancora, nel 2014 sono stati 40.000 gli, gli ettari alluvionati, quindi ancora peggio. Per finire con la gestione degli eventi estremi. Qui nel 2015 è successa una cosa più unica che rara, perché eh, si è abbattuto sulla laguna di Venezia, si è abbattuto un tornado che è stato classificato un F4, quindi di tipo assolutamente eh, tropicale. Per noi non ci sono dubbi, non siamo scienziati, ma non abbiamo dubbi che il clima si sta tropicalizzando. Il secondo concetto che di cui voglio parlare è la, la subsidenza dei terreni, che è una cosa che quasi nessuno considera, ma è molto importante per il nostro territorio, perché siamo pieni di coste. Quindi la subsidenza è il fenomeno per il quale il terreno viene ad abbassarsi tutti gli anni. È un fenomeno naturale, quindi non è che, che cioè lo conosciamo per essere un fenomeno naturale, succederebbe anche senza... Il, il riscaldamento terrestre. Il problema qual è? Che cosa c'entra con noi? C'entra perché questo fenomeno, ecco questo è un esempio, quella strada è la stessa nel, nel 1930 e, nel, e, e oggi, e vedete che eh, nel nostro delta del Po, per esempio, abbiamo perso quasi due metri di livello, perché quella strada era costruita lì, perché lì c'era la strada. E questo succede perché sono territori eh, di bonifica, quindi tende ad abbassarsi molto più velocemente. Questa cosa però, eh, unita al fatto che 
il riscaldamento terrestre provoca l'innalzamento poi dei mari e unito al fatto delle siccità mh, sempre più eh, invadenti provoca, eh, ecco qua, l'emergere poi del sale marino anche a 50 km dal mare. Perché succede? Perché eh, le, con la, le, il terreno si abbassa, il mare si alza e si intrufola attraverso i canali di irrigazione anche l'estate scorsa a 50 km, eccolo qua, lo vedete qui, Queste sono, qui è stata trovata acqua marina, il mare è qua. Quindi eh, questa è una rete tra l'altro di eh, letti di fiumi antichissimi, che noi abbiamo anche questo problema, sono delle grandissime autostrade di sabbia perché sono i tracciati dove correva l'acqua dei fiumi un tempo, anche migliaia di anni fa, e che peggiorano ulteriormente la situazione perché fungono da spugna, quindi attirano l'acqua del mare dentro i canali di irrigazione, dal sottosuolo nelle falde, quindi rendendola inutilizzabile per scopi agricoli e soprattutto per scopi alimentari. Questo è sempre il sale. Abbiamo poi il problema degli, dei cosiddetti parassiti alieni. Che cosa sono? I parassiti alieni sono coloro che noi chiamiamo, ne facevamo menzione anche prima, sono eh, quelle, quegli animali, quelle patologie anche, che si sono spostati in conseguenza dello spostarsi delle fasce climatiche. Eh, potevo fare tantissimi esempi, ho scelto di farvi i più recenti. Eh, la cimice asiatica, che è questa, ha rovinato quest'estate, la scorsa estate ha rovinato la gran parte della produzione di ortofrutticola dalle mie parti, con le sue punture. Questo parassita si è insinuato in una nicchia biologica cacciando il nostro eh, animale, diciamo, tipico, ecco, quindi anche una perdita di biodiversità, e non c'è modo di, cioè non, non reagisce come gli altri ai, ai, mh, ai trattamenti che facciamo per tenerli lontani. Questo è un po' meno conosciuto, questa foto non sono andata lontano a farla perché questa è casa mia. Questa pianta ha, eh, è stimata avere 400 anni ed è stata attaccata, come negli ultimi 7-8 anni, dalla piralide del bosso, che è un insetto monofago che si è trasferito qui da altre fasce climatiche e che in Veneto ha trovato una coltura di bossi mh, sterminata e ha praticamente devastato tutti i giardini all'italiana che avevamo, perché i giardini delle ville venete venivano ehm, costruiti con questa pianta proprio perché non era attaccabile da, da nessuno e quindi era molto resistente. Eh, abbiamo annientato anche un patrimonio artistico molto, molto ingente. Ehm, che cosa possiamo fare? Certo, questa è una presa d'atto, però non è che dobbiamo starcene con le mani in mano. Ieri il Presidente Obama diceva che è vero, non possiamo più fermarla questa, questa, questo, questo trend, però dobbiamo cercare di fare tutto quello che è possibile per restare sul, sul livello più basso delle previsioni, sul livello più ottimista. Questo si può fare. Com'è che lo possiamo fare? Beh, eh, primo di tutto, primo comandamento, non sprecare. Su questo noi stiamo lavorando con, il, con la comunità dei giovani di Confagricoltura, eh, stiamo lavorando molto sull'innovazione, sull'agricoltura di precisione, stiamo lavorando sul, sul produrre di più con meno risorse e quindi sull'ottimizzazione di tutto quello che avviene nel processo produttivo. Ehm, stiamo ottenendo dei buoni risultati e attraverso l'innovazione fino con l'irrigazione per esempio a scorrimento che è una tecnica di irrigazione molto arcaica si impiegavano eh, 40 litri a ettaro più o meno per, per irrigare, adesso ne basta grosso modo, ne basta la metà, un terzo quasi. Quindi è, una, è una, una cosa molto promettente, è una cosa su cui stiamo molto lavorando. Ed è per questo anche che siamo qui, quindi innovatori sull'innovazione di processo, fatevi avanti, ecco. Poi il water governance, che, che cos'è? Eh, è um, secondo noi bisogna che eh, innanzitutto l'autorità la, che, che, che governa le acque sia la stessa e sia unica, perché in Italia il problema grosso è che eh, la, la, il governo delle acque è polverizzato in tantissime competenze diverse, abbiamo tantissimi interlocutori diversi e invece il referente deve essere uno dalla sorgente alla foce dei fiumi. E le storage facilities le ho chiamate, quindi eh, questo è l'aspetto infrastrutturale invece, 
che eh, consta nel fatto che dobbiamo assolutamente architettare dei sistemi, delle infrastrutture nuove per riuscire a trattenere da una parte l'acqua quando viene e per tutelarci anche dai rischi idrogeologici di cui, eh, di cui sopra. E questo perché? Perché l'acqua deve comunque sempre rimanere una risorsa per noi, non può essere che diventi una minaccia come invece sta diventando. Il terzo recupero della memoria. Qui ho messo una, una considerazione eh, di coscienza, la coscienza che le persone devono recuperare per rimettersi in, uh, in linea, rimettersi in contatto con la terra, con, le sue, con i suoi respiri, con i suoi, con i suoi ritmi. E le persone devono sapere che cosa è successo anche in passato alla terra, devono, dovrebbero, tutti dovrebbero studiare questi fenomeni. Di, di cambiamento climatico e come l'umanità ha risposto negli anni a questi fenomeni per sopravvivere. Dall'altra parte, è una, una considerazione più generale, dovremmo riallineare la nostra memoria con quella della Terra. Chi più chi meno, eh, la Terra, hanno più, hanno meno, scusatemi, la Terra è valutata avere 3,5-4 miliardi di anni. Se pensiamo, se pensiamo che, che l'uomo... 10.000 anni fa diventò un agricoltore. Abbiamo imparato a scrivere 5.000 anni fa. Quindi la Terra sono tanti anni, cioè è molto più vecchia di noi. Io prima sorridevo quando sentivo parlare di un malato nei confronti della Terra. Noi agricoltori lo sappiamo bene. Il malato non è la Terra. Non è la Terra che è in pericolo. Siamo noi che siamo in pericolo su di essa. Okay? La Terra vive benissimo anche senza di noi e si ricorda le cose di millennio in millennio, non di minuto in minuto come noi. Noi dovremmo assolutamente cercare di riallineare i nostri ricordi con quelli della Terra. Non possiamo costruire sopra i letti dei fiumi, non possiamo coltivare certe, certe cose in certi posti perché già sappiamo come va a finire, solo che dobbiamo andare sempre più indietro, dovremmo metterci assieme anche con storici, con scienziati, con agricoltori, tutti assieme insieme per recuperare questa, questa memoria della Terra. Ultima cosa molto importante, l'architettura di una nuova era, della nuova era di cui prima, dell'antropocene in qualche modo. No? E questa cosa passa per la ricerca, per la ricerca e per lo sviluppo. Lo diceva anche prima il signor Illi, ci, assolutamente non possiamo andare eh, a fare questo tipo di lotta con, con le armi che abbiamo, se non eh, attraverso la scienza. Quindi, attraverso nuove colture che non, 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 non devono per forza essere quelle che abbiamo già, ma eh, dobbiamo architettare un nuovo modo di nutrirci, forse anche attraverso piante nuove, attraverso alimenti diversi, attraverso mh, nuove caratteristiche che possiamo dare a quelli che già coltiviamo e, e che già alleviamo e eh, operatori anche di nuova generazione. Anche su questo noi giovani di Confagricoltura stiamo lavorando moltissimo perché crediamo che la formazione sia eh, assolutamente fondamentale. Queste due cose messe assieme devono portare poi a un new generation market però, no? Nel senso che noi, possiamo fare del, noi faremo del nostro meglio, la, la scienza farà sicuramente del suo meglio, Bisogna che sia anche il mercato che riconosce, che riconosce che si può sopravvivere così e che si può vivere anche in una maniera diversa. Quindi ecco, la cosa importante da eh, ricordare è il messaggio che volevo lanciare, è proprio questo. Eh, siamo qui eh, ospiti di un anfitrione generoso, eh, stiamo, stiamo, siamo ospiti felici eh, di, di, una, di, un, di un ospite che ci darà tutto per sempre fino a quando però non gli rompiamo troppo le scatole perché prima o dopo se non cambiamo mh, mentalità ci troveremo un po' a dormire nel pianerottolo e con questo concluso grazie mille Hello everyone, it's been um, a long session. Do any of you want to stretch? And please, um, it's hard to sit in a seat for a long time. Uh, my name's Stuart, and my son and I invented a different way of um, getting honey. I'm not sure if that's telling me that I... I might wait for the beeps to end. Okay, that's a bit better, isn't it? 
it's like that, that sound was saying that somehow I'm, um, there's something wrong with what I'm saying. Anyway, my, um, over a 10, 15 year period, my son and I developed a, a beehive that, where, where you could take the honey without opening the hive or disturbing the bees. It was gentler for the bees and gentler for the beekeeper, much easier. So, um, that's the title of the talk. The first thing I want to say is a, is a big thank you, a, a sort of gratitude for the situation I found myself in, for my father, who's up there, and uh, for my son, of course, my children, my, my big family. For I, I come from Australia, from the north coast of New South Wales, and, and so I'm very great, grateful for that community as well. And um, so, to just extend their gratitude and appreciation a little bit further, of course, I'm grateful to the bees, but, uh, but we know very much, all of the talks today have been talking about life, haven't they? About uh, the extraordinary existence we all have in this insanely complicated and um, absolutely beautifully marvellous system of life where we are all interconnected, we can't be separate. So, and the bees have been, uh, people know that there's been a lot of trouble with the bees uh, recently, that, that um, many, many colonies have been disappearing. So there's a picture of a, for a, from a poor old beekeeper who w went to visit his hives, or her hives, one afternoon, all the bees are outside dead. Now that, this might have been because of um, uh, pesticides, it might also have been just because there wasn't good enough nutrition for those bees, and um, they gradually got more and more stressed until they died. It, it might have been um, because the beekeeper wasn't watching out that there was enough food for them. Could be many, many different reasons. But another reason could be global climate change, which is, which is shifting everything around. And one part of being a beekeeper, and I'm a lucky beekeeper in that I'm me meeting beekeepers from all over the world, is most of them say to me, it's, I can't rely on the flowers to be the same every year anymore. I can't rely that first of all I have, you know, the first flowers of the season and then the next one comes on and then the next and the next and the bees get a continuous supply. That doesn't happen anymore. Beekeepers, along with so many other indicators, understand that climate change is having a huge impact and our systems are breaking down. So maybe those bees died from climate change. I just want to tell you a little story that happened yesterday. We have a, have a stand at the flow um, at, uh, where we're showing our beehive and so on, and a man came up and he said, so the, the bees, they live in this box, yes? And I said, yeah, yeah, they live in this box. And he said, do they stay in this box? And I said, yeah, yeah, they, that's their home, they stay in the box. And, and we talked for a bit longer and he said, you mean I can have this box in my lounge room and the bees will stay in it? Ah, no, no, you can't have the box of bees in your lounge room and the bees will stay in it. The bees need to fly out every day and they fly out for seven kilometres and they bring back the nectar and the pollen to their home. And every day they sp go out, spread themselves out and come back in again every day, in and out. And he said, oh, so they don't just stay in their box and make honey. No, no, they don't stay in their box and make honey. So it was a very surprising conversation for me because I hadn't, because I take it for granted that people understand bees. Okay. How do I get that on again? Like that. So that, yeah, that's, uh, they were just images of, um, clim of uh, deforestation or perhaps pesticides that are affecting our world. And I just wanted to say that Yep, um, in some countries up to 40% of the beehives die every year and the beekeepers have to work to replace them. And for me, that, that is a big problem, but 
what alarms me way, way more than that is the bees are the insects that we're seeing that are disappearing. How many other insects, how many other essential parts of the network of life that we live in are disappearing and we're not even seeing it every year? So as I said that um, my son and I have been on this journey of inventing a different sort of a beehive and uh, it all came from him saying there must be a better way than this crazy thing of pulling a beehive apart and getting stung and heavy gear to lift and we live in a subtropical area, it's very warm so you're sweaty inside your bee suit and yeah, we get stung a lot. And so that took us on a a, a many years journey of trying to figure out how to do it. I didn't think it was possible and I don't have time to tell you all of the details of that journey today because I want to try and link what we've done with climate change somehow. Basically, we figured out that maybe if you can move the honeycomb like that, then the honey can fall downwards. And um, and we found out that we could, we could do it. Then for me, and for my son, we, we had to think, well, okay, we can do this. We need to put plastic in the beehives. Um, we'll do our best with the plastic, make it high quality, food quality, um, BPA free, all of that. But still, it's plastic. And then, do beekeepers really need a new tool yet? Or are they okay? They've been doing the same practices for 150 years, do they need anything new? Will, it, will, it, will this mean that there are, there are more, less bees dying? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, is this a good idea? It, it seems very important to me that all of innovators and inventors and people with ideas for our world stop and say, hmm, is this really a good idea for the world that we want? So our generation after generation after generation of all of the different species live in abundance. And so I had to um, ask that question of myself, well, is this invention a good idea? And uh, of course, it's so exciting being an inventor. There's the next technical challenge again and again and again. I didn't want to stop. So I didn't think that it would make our invention would help increase the number of bees significantly for the world. I didn't think it would do that. And yes, it makes honey harvesting easier, but I wasn't sure whether in, in the scheme of things and what our world needs, how important that was. But what I did think about was how many um, people would like to keep bees but the, it's too hard work. And what about children? If they want to get involved with bees, they, they can't lift, you know, 30 kilo boxes of honey. They need someone to help them. They can't do it. Well, there's so many beekeepers I know that have bad backs because it's such hard physical work. Many of them want to keep keeping bees, but they can't anymore. And, and women, it's somehow beekeeping hasn't been set up for women because the boxes are so big and heavy. So I thought, Maybe if, if our invention helps more people keep, keep bees, that's a good thing for those people that want to. But then I've got another idea, and that is keeping bees is different from keeping a cat or a dog or a goldfish. Keeping bees is being involved with something that is still wild. It's, it's not bees are still wild, wild creatures. We put them in a box, but when they want to, they fly out and, um, and they're gone. And, uh, and so keeping bees gets a person, whether they're little or whether they're old, male, female, gets a person in touch with life and the complexity of life. There's many, many other ways that, that people can get in touch with the, the beauty of life that we all live in. Gardening, um, hiking, many, many different ways, and beekeeping is one, and, uh, and one that I find endlessly fascinating. But 
beekeeping also gets you in touch with another way of living because we think of each individual bee as somehow being precious. And it sort of is, but really it's more important to think of bees or, or a bee colony as an entity, a superorganism. So there might be 40, 50,000 bees in one beehive, but each individual isn't so important. What is important is the whole. And bees make decisions democratically, unbelievably. Yeah, there might be a queen bee, but she's not the boss. There are 30, 40,000 bees together deciding which flowers they'll go for, deciding if we're going to leave this, this box, where will we go? They'll decide that together. So bees are incredibly fascinating and they get us in touch with the wild. And for me, that meant maybe if more people become beekeepers, then more people will understand the precious world that I and so many of us love and how com complicated it is, how interconnected it is and how we are dependent. We're part of this. That was my excuse anyway to keep going with the invention. And what happened, I'll just stop that for a moment, sorry. What happened was, um, was uh, an incredible thing for me and my son as we did crowdfunding and um, to raise the money to start this invention, to show this invention to the world. And just because of luck, because of being in the right place in the right time, because we could make some good movies, because it was about bees, because it was a new in innovation and, and hadn't been done before. I don't know all the reasons, really. In this crowdfunding campaign two years ago, we raised $12 million. It was like, I'm still a little bit in shock. So all of a sudden, my son and I were responsible for delivering 25,000 beehives to 130 different countries all around the world, and it hasn't stopped. And so my little idea of me and my son in Australia, maybe we can make, get honey from a beehive without opening it, has turned into this big thing. And I've got to say, is it true? Is my idea true that somehow if there's more beekeepers, we'll have a better world? And I think, well, we're only two years old, but here's some quotes. Here's one here. The first season, I've enjoyed watching and experiencing beekeeping. I love the fragrance of the new wax, the hum of the bees, and then, as the comb fills, the sweet, sweet bouquet of the store honey, I tell you, to sit beside a bee, beehive in the afternoon as the sun's going down, you've got to do it. It's such a beautiful, sweet smell as the bees dry out the nectar that they've brought in that day. I see how in, in it is so important to our world and existence here on planet Earth. The bees, we're connected to them. I'm a small but important part. So that was what I was hoping for when I was thinking, was this a good idea? That's one of the hundreds and hundreds, uh, I guess thousands of um, emails and messages we've had. Another beekeeper said, no matter how much you learn about beekeeping, there's always more. In fact, the more you learn, the more you realize that you know very, very little. We need humility in this world, don't we? we? We don't need people saying, I know the way, I'm afraid. We don't need people like that. We need people who understand there's still more to learn, that we're only a small part of this, and there's so much that we cannot see or imagine yet. So another beekeeper said, I live in a city that does not allow beekeeping. Well, they're in California. It was a flow hive that inspired me to get interested into beekeeping. I got in, um, into it so much that I literally was the driving force be behind changing our local beekeeping ordinance. So there are rules in Hossam's, in California's um, locality was that people weren't allowed to keep bees for some reason. So he became active. And so that's what, I was hope, that's what I'm hoping for too, that as we understand how precious our world is and that the wild is part of us, it's not a box that we can put in our lounge room that somehow honey comes out without anything else. Our world is incredibly complex and 
um, we, can do, we can stand up and do something about it. So I was inspired by that. So besides um, inspiring people to keep bees, we, in, in my little small company, um, have decided we should keep putting up inspirational and educational things because we need to understand things. So we, um, we have um, Meet the Beekeeper series where you can just for a few minutes um, watch a video of someone that's just beginning on their journey of getting bees and, um, and beginning to understand it. And it's funny and it's um, quirky and uh, it's just fun to watch these stories. So here we go. Have we made a difference? We've uh, delivered 44 or probably 45,000 or more beehives now, so that's wonderful that there's all these more beehives around the world and people engaged with beekeeping. Um, yeah, we won some awards. We, um, we not only have Meet the New Beekeeper series, but we've got interviews with very, very experienced beekeepers who are talking about their passion for bees. So one of those, for example, is a man called John Gates in Canada who's kept, who's been a, a commercial beekeeper and a beekeeping inspector all his life. And he talks about cold climate beekeeping. That's just one example. This says, look, I'm, I'm just a bit distracted because the clock says I've only been talking for three minutes. That's hard to believe. Um, so, well, I'll just keep talking. The other thing that's been really important in terms of um, encouraging people to keep bees and being involved is that actually there's, there's a lot to learn in terms of bee husbandry. Because of the world we live in these days, bee diseases or diseases and pests that affect bees have spread to most countries all around the world. So a beekeeper these days has to learn all about the, the diseases and pests that might impact on their colonies. And uh, they also just have to learn how to care for bees in their particular region because, because every different area has a different climate, different um, plants, different situations to deal with. So we say please join up with beekeepers in your area, um, join up with a community that's already there and learn about beekeeping from the experts in your area. And so we've been able to support those clubs in various ways with, so they have um, things to raffle and raise money and so on so to encourage people to join up with a local bee club. What else is happening? So that, that is the essence of what I wanted to say, is that I'm so grateful for the life I have, for the life we have that's uh, undescribably miraculous, isn't it, to be alive. And it's so important to me that whatever we do, we're doing it thinking about, is this good for our world? Whatever it is we do, is it good for our world in, in the way that we think about it? And once we've done that, we have to check, well, is, is what I thought would be good for that, our world, is, is that actually happening? That's, that's the story. That's the thank you. And thank you very much for your attention.